This week's episode is sponsored by Pouch. Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, the movie is about to begin. Please take your seats. Good evening, and welcome to Theatre 9. By now, you should be sitting comfortably, ready for the movie. But there's still time to grab some refreshments from the lobby. We would like to remind you that the use of any recording device is strictly prohibited. Please take this moment to turn off all mobile phones. Warning. This movie contains flashing lights and sudden, loud noises. Lastly, Please pay particular attention to the emergency exits. Thank you, and good night. Welcome back to our Good Murderer podcast. It is series four. We are finally back. Oh my God, they're back again. I'm Tom Norris and I'm joined by, of course he's here, it is Ben Carter. Super duper happy to be back, Tom. And we've been away for a while. Um, hope we're not rusty. Well, I'm not. Um, Dan, how you doing? I'm very good. I'm very good. I'm, I'm ready for some spooky stories. <laughs> oh my God. See... Okay, I've expecting big things from Dan this series. Smashed the last series of the intro, it's already smashing that now. But before we continue, we want to say a huge thank you to the sponsor of this week's episode, which is Pouch. Pouch is a free desktop browser extension that automatically finds and applies the best discount codes when you're shopping online. So Ben, you know I like my trainers. Lo- he loves his trainers. Always going on about my trainers. And earlier on, I fancied getting myself a new pair of trainers. So I went over to the Adidas store, picked a pair of trainers I liked went to the checkout and Pouch automatically popped up, found and applied the best discount code and saved me 30% off. That's £27. Why wouldn't you download it if it's as easy as that? Well, that's it. It's completely free and it works on over 3,000 UK sites. So not just Adidas, uh, Just Eat. So we'll be getting some Subway for lunch, I'm sure. Yeah, and then uh, Booking.com as well. If you want to, if, if you know, if you find this podcast a bit stressful, you want to get away from the other two, uh, Booking.com, we go then save some money off as well. And a lot of people have been asking about the shirts. It also covers Boohoo and ASOS and Boohoo and ASOS. So Pouch only takes a couple clicks to install. And once you've installed it, make sure you pin it to your browser. So why not get Pouch for free right now by simply clicking the link at the top of this description. Or head over to joinpouch.com forward slash I forward slash I could murder a podcast. And using our link really helps support the podcast. You'd be a fool to miss it. An idiot. Absolutely. Ben, we're back. What have you been up to in the time we've had off? Oh, fantastic. Uh, Well, we've, we've, we've had your stag do. Yep. We've had your wedding. Yep. And I've had a haircut. That sounds like a crazy time, Ben. I want to say thank you to everyone for all their lovely messages uh, about the wedding. It's very much appreciated. Thank you very much. It was a glorious day. The sun was shining. The weather was sweet. Married for a week and a day now. Any advice um, for Dan? Any advice for Dan? Uh, Just enjoy it, Dan, to be honest. Great. You got it in the bag. I know you can smash this and uh, keep your head up. Thank you. Ben? um... (laughs) Why are you laughing? (laughs) (laughs) It's not for everyone. Um, So... (laughs) <laughs> nah, you'll get there. It's not a race. And you don't need to get there if you're happy. Just be ha- if you're happy, then you're happy. Clap your hands. Other new things you might have noticed in the merch store, we have we have a lot of new items. We have a new yeah. coloured hat, we have badges and we have stickers. So that's all available at uh www.icmap.store. It is. And don't forget to follow us on our socials, Instagram, Twitter, at Could Murder a Pod, and over on Facebook where we post a lot of images that kind of like 
teasing what's going to come in the next following weeks and this is going to be a 12 episode series once again you'll be glad to hear and there's a lot of big cases we're going to be looking into super big cases coming up and in the meantime in the break that we've had we've we, you know not just totally disappeared we've been very active on our patreon page which is patreon.com forward slash could murder a pod there's now 33 episodes there's a lot guys yeah and everyone that has continued to support us on there thank you so so much it's basically a pound a week new episode every week and uh, we do requests um Yes, exactly. We do a lot of requests on there for some of the smaller cases. We let you guys vote for which ones we're going to do. It's a lot more kind of interactive over there. So be sure to go over there and check that out. But there you have it. Series four. And who would have thought that we'd be opening series four with Mr. James Holmes? Well, we picked it, so probably us. But it is a big case. Ben, uh, what are your memories of the case when it happened? Um, not a massive Batman guy. Not a massive superhero guy. Uh, just had it on the news. You like John Favreau, the chef. That's one of the films you Love like. That really like that movie. Yeah. I know you do. That's why I said it. Um, but you don't really. <laughs> Those cheese sandwiches look delicious. Yes, uh, there was a name for them, but uh, grilled cheese. Yeah, but something in like Cuban Cuban sandwich. And so today's case, the series opener, is the case of James Holmes and the Aurora Cinema shooting. So what I remember from this case was I remember there being the huge Batman link. Obviously, with obviously happening when the dark dark Knight rises, but I remember hearing that he was dressed as the Joker and all these mm. things, which I kind of without really looking into it, I've always had that in my image in my head. But that was very much not the case. And the, on the very initial moments, it was kind of you didn't believe it was true. You thought it was some sort of um, m- some sort of marketing campaign for the movie itself, but obviously that wasn't the case uh, at all. Like. Yeah, I think a lot of people were then kind of deterred from going to the see to see um, that particular film just afraid of copycats and whatnot um but yeah this case it's a really kind of it, it's great it's, it's based around a lot to do with mental health and kind of uh, wellness checks which maybe weren't as thorough as they should have been mm-hmm. um there's again like that there's a lot of red flags in this case which you hope now there's things in play to kind of ensure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again but we're going to go into all of that do our usual uh, format going through his childhood seeing if there's any kind of big uh, red flags there and then going into the, the day itself yeah and although he's been charged spoiler alert um there are still a lot of conspiracies attached to this case which makes it kind of an interesting one so as always people have very very different opinions on whether he acted alone or um as part of a, a false flag group um uh, as well as maybe a potential whole uh sing yeah so it's widely believed that he didn't act alone and that he was possibly part of a a wider syndicate or um uh, you know um group of people that that conducted the activity itself so lots of conspiracies attached we're gonna we're gonna go through all the different ones there but yeah very interesting case uh very sad case of course and um yeah one that we remember fairly well with it being fairly fairly recent yeah 2012 yeah so you know nine years ago now um but let's, should we get into it, Ben? Let's do it. So James Egan Holmes was born on December 13th, 1987 in San Diego, California. I think that's got to be the closest subject we've covered to our own age group. It's interesting. Making it about you. Us. Um, I didn't make it about <laughs> It's also strange saying this part in present tense, but his father uh, is Robert Holmes, who is a mathematician and also the senior lead scientist with an American credit score company called FICO, as well as his mother, Arlene Holmes, who is a registered nurse. And he has one sister called Chris Holmes. So Holmes was raised by his family in Oak Hills, California, and he had a fairly unexceptional childhood up until around the age of 10. At the age of 10, he became introverted. He struggled to find purpose and deeper meaning with his life, which I think for the age of 10 is quite a, a deep a deep thought to have. Um, and he also had an unusual interest in nuclear weapons, knives and guns. And throughout his childhood, he had night terrors, which involved a thing called nail ghosts. Yeah. Hammered, to... on the, hammered on the walls, shadow. So you basically would wake up, we have things flickering in his peripherals and, yeah, nail ghosts. Yeah, I tried to do a bit of research on that. I said, um, Alexa, what's a nail ghost? And um, she told me to go to bed. Fuck off. <laughs> At a similar time, he had daydreams about becoming a serial killer, but focused more so on the idea of becoming a mass murderer. So he was much more attracted to the idea of claiming multiple victims in one go rather than systematically and uh, periodically wiping out. Uh, yes, yeah, so just victims. I mean, just just dissect like that a little bit. So he's at the age of like ten and eleven here, and he's this. These are his thoughts already. That kind of idea of 
or murders from you know two parents who seem you know very well educated his father yeah a mathematician and scientist with degrees from stanford and berkeley and his mother a registered nurse like very like um intelligent family um i've seen interviews with them they seem you know seem very loving and they were very loving parents there wasn't any kind of neglect from them or any kind of they weren't like you know very strict or any you know very reli like hard religious families which, we, which we've seen with other cases yeah um so the kind of his mental state going this way is very it seems very random yeah definitely there was no kind of he wasn't bullied at all in his younger years i've, I've read conflicting stories on whether or not he was a loner i've, I've read that he had a, a core group of four or five friends but i've also read that he was a loner um, but no, apparently got on really well with other people. It's kind of around the age of 11 that he starts to have kind of mental health issues, depression, anxiety. Um, yeah, he actually attempted suicide at age 11. There you go. So, I mean, that as well, that's very, you know, a very striking thing to happen. Um, that's when, yeah, as you said, he was such, his mental health issues really kind of developed at the age of 11. And at 12 years old, he reportedly began to decline socially as well. So... Yeah, it seems to be here, and obviously stuff she's suffering from a lot of um, mental health issues at a very early stage. And at the age of 12 years old, his family make the decision to move back to San Diego, which maybe it was prompted by the suicide attempt. I can't really find any clear information as to why that move was made. It's kind of around two hours uh, south of where he was living, so not a massive kind of life-changing move either. Um, so yeah, he then uh, gets into junior varsity soccer and starts running cross-country marathons. He also enjoyed playing strategy and RPG games, including World of Warcraft and Dungeons and Dragons. He said that he preferred playing video games to living his real life uh, because he, it was an escape for him, escape, an escape from reality, and he could live the life of a hero. Yeah, I think a lot of people, a lot of um, people, kind of find escapism within those games. And I think before, like a few of the other cases, like. Um Anders Breivik was very into playing Call of Duty um, and those kind of, they kind of see it as they want to be like the characters they're playing, which and then there's a few similarities with Breivik in this case. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Definitely. Is. So yeah, as Ben mentioned, there's kind of conflicting reports about his, his childhood. Um, I read that he had, did have a group of friends and, um, but he didn't really date much. He wasn't uh, overly successful with the ladies. According to his peers, Holmes was very sociable and very intelligent, highly intelligent person, top of the class in, in a lot of cases. He excelled academically in almost every subject and was brilliant at taking on and fully exploring new information, as well as that quite sporty, so playing soccer, going on runs, um, not being bullied, not a loner, though that part can be kind of argued both ways. So by all accounts, apart from the attempted suicide and some mental health um, issues that he was facing, it's quite a stable upbringing exactly it's, it's very very different to a lot of the, the cases we looked at before um because yeah there's not a lot of times it is to do with the family or it is to do with being bullied um with this it just seems to be a manifestation in his in his mind it's a, a craving that he has which seems to be you know completely random yeah yeah and it, i mean the the only other things that were of note is that he was considered to be fairly awkward in some social settings and was often found with uh, a vacant stare on his face, either looking at different walls or looking at cars go past. Yeah, he'd often, yeah, just kind of stare away. And then before, some students before have kind of, you know, seen if he was okay, because he's just staring at a wall. And then he kind of turned around and just kind of looked right through them with a kind of creepy grin. Um, so you're very kind of spaced out with this. As well as the nail ghosts, he would also see shadows and flickers in the corner of his eyes. And he would claim that these shadows would fight each other with guns and other weapons. Like... I, you know the eye bogeys when you shut your eyes and you try and follow the dot and it what a bit more elaborate than eye bogeys eye bogeys, eye bogeys. Eye bogeys. what do you mean just sleep in your eyes not sleeping no you know if you like look into a light and then you shut your eyes and then you follow and you the call light. it eye bogeys I, I don't know what this scientific term they've is. never been called that I think eye bogeys is just what some people call sleep sleep definitely in the eyes but eye bogeys what are those things then Dan floaters 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 yeah I mean Sorry. again another gross word but you know, eye bogeys. So anyway, yeah, quite elaborate that his eye floaters. I don't think that's what he's seeing. Mm. It's not those floaters shooting at each other. I can imagine like a game of Pong if I shut my eyes. They're in his peripherals, you said. So it's yeah. like where he's laying there. I, I imagine his eyes aren't shut. That's an interesting and fully valid point. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs>
So in his early 20s, Holmes worked as a counsellor at a summer camp in Glendale, California. And this for the, for the ages between 7 and 14. Um, he was responsible for 10 children. And th- th- he was apparently a great. There was no kind of disciplinary uh, problems with him. He was able to you know, function in the right way, look after the children, make sure they, they conducted their activities. It's You kind of think... His parents probably this stage, obviously, you know, they, they know he suffered with these kind of like, obviously, you no, know, he, he attempted to commit suicide at 11. They're probably thinking he's on the straight and narrow now. He's a good student. He's excelling at sport. That kind of thing for the idea that he was very insular, playing games online, wanting to kind of escape. Mm-hmm. It's a bit, that's like the complete opposite job that I imagine. Because I'm thinking like to be a counsellor and be, you have to be kind of bubbly and be kind of the centre of attention. You're, yeah. you're, if anything, you're a role model for those children. It seems like a complete opposite job role for you know, what Holmes appears to be. That's it. And and to, I know everyone kind of before and after certain crimes did look strikingly different. For Holmes, when you look back, there's kind of a mixture in the news archive footage of him, of him as a student doing public speaking, uh, playing sports, him in team photos, and he's got like the biggest smile on his face, easy go, and then him, that transition to him after he's carried out this horrible, horrible um, attack is just, it's its two completely different people. Definitely. And to go back to being the centre of attention as well, um, he apparently, the reason he excelled so much at his studies is because he didn't want to be the centre of attention, so he would make sure that his homework was done on time to a high standard because he felt that if if uh, if he was underperforming, that would get him attention. Yeah, he, he think it, he obviously being called out by his teachers, maybe them speaking to his parents, he just wanted to go to fly under the radar. And yeah, that, that prompted him to be very, top very, of the class. yeah, top of the class. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, it's very interesting. Smart. Literally. Yeah. I mean, what else would it mean? What's the non-literal sense? Smart, that, smart way of. Probably want to cut that one, Bonsi. No, um, maybe. Bonsi, maybe not. Do you want to keep that in? If it gets a laugh, then yeah. Uh, I, I'd keep it in. You'd keep it in? I yeah. would. Really? You look like a right dumb f- yeah, okay, that's fair. <laughs> keep it in, joking. keep it in. So during this time, despite outward uh, appearances of being a really outgoing, happy-go-lucky kind of character, he would still drift between depression and being totally withdrawn to the point where some people actually believed he was completely mute. Um, he would sometimes still, though, have dramatic outbursts that were seen as attention-seeking behaviours, which kind of goes against what I just said about his studies. Um, and sometimes uh, colleagues of his at a later role that he took at a pill and capsule coating factory in San Diego claim to have found him um, at a laboratory workstation staring blankly at a wall for up to four minutes. That's very precise timing. Mm. There. Yeah, so as I said, that even, even that highlights the kind of how bizarre it seems him being a counsellor at, at a summer camp, that kind of behaviour. So he's been kind of quite manic here, going from being very full of beans to be essentially mute and, and staring at a wall. Um, in 2010, he received his undergrad um, degree in neuroscience with the highest honours. As, as we said, he was very, very intelligent. Um, Graduated in the top 1%. Yeah. Yeah. So, Smart. yeah, of his class with a 3.949 GPA, which to me, that doesn't mean a thing. So he was a member as well of several honour societies, including Phi Beta Kappa, which basically that is the oldest academic honour society in the United States and is often just and is often described as the most prestigious one, and Golden Key, which is a very similar one to that. So, and that's when you're expecting him to make the jump uh, into into you know forming a career, maybe, um, and following in the footsteps of his father, who yeah. has a background in kind of software development as well. But instead of that, he remains living with his with his parents and would spend all day sleeping and all night gaming. Um, his parents then convince him to pursue a graduate degree at the University of Colorado, and so he moves to Aurora, which I think is a Great sounding place. What? It's just like the, the word Aurora. Um, but Realis. <laughs> <laughs> so Holmes was also described as being a very effective group leader, a person who takes an active role in his education and brings a great amount of intellectual and emotional maturity into the classroom. So there seems to be just very conflicting accounts here of, of, mm. of Holmes in terms of being either being, as we said, like possibly mute to being you know, a very well-respected person in the classroom. So despite this, um, Holmes would continue to live with his parents uh, where he would uh, sleep all day and game all night. His parents then got to the point where they decided to start pushing him to apply for a post-grad degree. Um, He makes multiple applications and he is best remembered uh, by different universities as uh, submitting his application with a picture of himself with a llama. That's one way to be remembered. 
So Holmes was actually accepted to IUC where he was offered a 22,600 stipend and free tuition. And that so shows how sought after he was by, by these universities. And he actually declined their offer without specifying a reason. Yeah, and an interesting note, he applied for, as I said, he applied for multiple uh, graduate programs with different schools. Uh, but some one of the quotes I found was that they found him to be disconnected, bizarre, aloof, and show a complete lack of effect. So uh, he decides to make the move to Aurora. And this is where kind of living away from his parents for the first time, apart, apart from the summer camp work, um, really seemed to accelerate. Uh, certain fantasies and certain mental health issues that, that Holmes was facing. Um, his homicidal fantasies would increase here and he would become increasingly more socially withdrawn. So as Ben said, he's moving to Aurora and in a rental application for the apartment, he describes himself very differently to what uh, those people said. He was quiet and easygoing. As well as this, he did have some digital footprints um, like uh, an old MySpace uh, profile uh, and a dating profile on Match.com. You haven't been to that one yet, have you? Uh, Match.com. Granddad. Married. Um, have you been on there? <laughs> uh, also an adult friend finder. Been on there. Yeah. Big time. How's it going? <laughs> is it dot org? Not a charity, is it? So um I don't know. <laughs> Something <laughs> some cases. As well as this, Holmes had an old resume on the employment website Monster. Dot com. Dot com. And according to a few sources, Holmes had also allegedly hired sex workers online and left reviews for their services on an online message board. So these dating profiles were created just weeks before uh, the eventual shooting. Um, on each of these profiles, a man appearing to be James Holmes posted a disturbingly telling question as a tagline of his uh, dating bio. Ask me it. Will you visit me in prison? No. And there you have it. You're dressed a bit like... Like a bowler. Not Ebola, a bowler. <laughs> I didn't... <laughs> Just, I love how your minds jump into what I'm going to say. Oh, I have to. I think, you know I have to think three or four lines ahead when I'm sat next to you. And you're still a few pages behind. Oh. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. And Dan. <laughs> so as we mentioned, he didn't have a lot, a lot of luck with the ladies, but he did end up dating a fellow biology student in October of mm. 2011. A lot of chemistry there. Biology. Um, Holmes, Science pun. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. Um, but they're broken. Two seconds. Two seconds. Two okay. seconds. Okay. Sorry, Dan. Go on then. You bet. Yeah. Oh, I guess you could say there's great chemistry there. Um, but they. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and their breakup apparently. Well, it was. It's been theorised this kind of really contributed to his violent depression. After that, it kind of spiraled after this. Mm -hmm. But his girlfriend said to you, he was very kind of distant and awkward. Um, and yeah, it wasn't a very, you know, it wasn't a unhealthy relationship in, in regards to him being violent or anything like that. But he did actually say to her, mention to her that he did have a hunger for killing, which again, like it has, you know, earlier on when he kind of had these, these fantasies, it wasn't taken very seriously. So according to this uh, young lady, uh, the relationship lasted about two months and it ended when she felt distant with him following an argument they had after he accused her of talking to another man on St. Patrick's Day. Um, she said that Holmes often made flat jokes, which, I, yeah, I, I wonder what that meant, but apparently it just means dry, dry jokes. Oh. She also recommended Holmes getting professional help um, when he started making these claims about killing to her, but he, he would outright refuse this. So another resident of Holmes' apartment block who worked in a nearby factory said Holmes was always wearing camouflage pants and a hat. The area he lived in Aurora was apparently quite a rough area as well. He had a very kind of clear structure to his day. He would go to a Mexican food truck, get his breakfast burrito, I don't yeah. know, Brits and breakfast food, and then in the evening he'd go to a kind of Cuban bar, kind of sit by himself, just drinking a beer, a few beers, not talking to anyone, and then just go home. Which apparently, in that kind of neighbourhood, he would have stuck out like a sore thumb just sitting there. He's very baffling in terms of his behaviour, because as we said look, throughout this whole thing, one moment he seems very insular, he doesn't want to speak to anyone, just be online, and just kind of exist through that world, but then he seems to be actively putting himself out there to be in a social situation. Uh, there's not much more to it. Was he going there to hopefully to meet someone or anything like that? But he would be sitting there by himself, buy a few beers and then just kind of go home. Um, not making a scene, just kind of be there and then gone. Mm. So 
he seems to contradict it seems to contradict his kind of behaviors a lot throughout this time so shortly after the breakup uh, with his girlfriend Holmes decides to actually get some support uh, with the mental health issues that he was facing he basically makes professional contact with a social worker who would later claim that this is the most anxious guy I've ever seen and he has symptoms of OCD but most concerning is that he has thoughts of killing people though I don't think he is dangerous let me just repeat that line he has thoughts of killing people though I don't think he's dangerous Mm. This is the most obvious red flag for from this case. He he does mention this hunger and this thought and need he has to kill people, multiple people to different people. He says this, mm -hmm. and people just seem to be like, okay, well, he's never committed a crime previously. Uh, look, probably looking at his CV in terms of you know he was a, he worked as a counselor in summer camp. He, he was a, the grade A student. He was a very intelligent guy. Takes photos with llamas. Just one uh, that we're aware of, but possibly more. Um, but they don't think that he's gonna. There seems to be something blocking them from thinking this is a, an outright threat. Or they're like, or they're just like, he that that guy's not gonna snap. He's too. He's able to. He's able to compose himself. Maybe I don't know. I don't know. It's really bizarre. The social worker went on to say it was difficult to interview him because he would. Uh, he would maintain a blank stare and take a long time to answer. Um, Holmes told them that he had never hurt anybody and never would. So maybe he's also kind of conflicting. He's, you know, he's saying he has hom homicidal urges, but then saying, but I'd, I'd never do anything about it. I don't know. Um, the social worker noted that he had a number of odd mannerisms, including uh, not saying hello or goodbye or thank you or any other customary remarks on his way out. The worker also thought that he may have been uh, in the middle of a psychotic break. So he would later go on to see a psychiatrist called Dr. Lynn Fenton. She had a lot of the similar kind of concerns. Um, she was very worried about his homicidal ideation, uh, which he, in the last meeting they had together, that he expressed this kind of hunger uh, to, to harm people. She saw him a total of seven times over three months, but Holmes rejected the, the suggestion that they suggested for treatment. He rejected that. She listed some of the specific concerns, and one of them was his long-standing fantasy about killing as many people as possible. Um, but he had a reluctance to tell her about the plans or anything like that for it. Following this kind of conversations, they did they did consider placing him on a, in a voluntary mental health hold, but they decided against it, noting that the belief that Holmes was borderline and the commitment would would only inflame him. So, yeah, it's it's uh, like we said, there's quite a few big red flags here, which you, you're surprised that they didn't you know take this more seriously with him actually someone actually saying, you know, I'm. I've got this hunger, I've got this urge. I mean, Holmes even sent her a threatening email, um, which she then activated a threat assessment team to help her formulate a plan for Holmes. Yeah, it didn't lead to anything enough. There wasn't enough there. And it was it was decided, no, he's borderline. It might actually make him worse. Um, I heard one voicemail that was recovered from, I think it was this particular uh, Lynn Fent Dr. Lynn Fenton, mm. um, who had, was speaking to another uh, uh, mental health professional. And she was basically saying, oh, you know, don't worry about our guy, James. Um, I've just spoken with the mother and it turns out that this has been going on for a long time, uh, you know, since his childhood. Yeah. And I don't know how that... Because, yeah, it meant, she mentioned that she wasn't sure of his new behaviour at first. and But if oh, if he's managed to hold it together for this long... And surely there's not going to be a breaking point. Yeah. yeah. It's, but if, It's tricky. It is very tricky. And, like, his parents, there's lots of interviews with them, and they were kind of beating themselves up, thinking, you know, if anyone should have known about this, it should have been us. Which, you know, I think is very unfair for them but well, they shouldn't blame themselves really they were checking in they thought that it was a really positive step that he was talking to dr lynn fenton and that you know it was, oh he's finally getting some help and he's going to these meetings yeah. and you know they're they're thinking about they're thinking of ideas to how to help him so um yeah it's, it's, it, they're very sad interviews to see from them kind of taking the blame so around about this time as well holmes got very obsessed with a low budget movie called suffocator of sins which is a kind of vigilante kind of movie and he actually phoned the director Dave Argon this is what Dave Argon had to say about the phone call he told me he'd watched it a hundred times and he was pressing for more details about the film he came off as very articulate nervous on the meek side and he said he was obviously interested in the body count so yeah it's kind That's of shows. yeah it just shows he was for obviously from Dave Argon's point of view this is the first time you know only interactions had with him so he couldn't place any more kind of weight in those words or the questions it could have just been someone just you know interested in that kind of movie but um, yeah it just kind of shows where his head was at at the time 
So yeah, in 2012, Holmes' academic performance started to decline um, quite a lot, and he scored very poorly on an exam, which for him, like we said before, he wants to go under the radar. He's a grade A student in the top one percentile, and this is very out of character for him. Um, they weren't planning to expel him or anything like that. Holmes did would withdraw himself from the university three days after failing this key oral exam. He dropped out with no further explanation. So around the same time as this, he had a final diagnosis from his treatment come through, which was schizoid personality disorder. And they were able to also rule out um, any chance of him being uh, on the autistic spectrum or have any kind of schizophrenic disorder. Um, so at that point, again, they still make the decision not to refer any any well not to refer any other professionals in but also not to explore further treatment he kind of goes off the radar completely well he's yeah he's re he's refusing treatment isn't he and like that's that's the, obviously if someone doesn't want to get better or receive that treatment you can't enforce it on them but like we said but there's red flags and him actively saying he's you know wants to do these things you think that is kind of time when the state need to step in and, mm -hmm. and act. And his parents said in an interview that if they knew about these things, which they didn't know, still having these thoughts, they they're not you know they don't well they don't know if they could have stopped him like, but they said they would have actively been you know trying to. It kind of reminds me of Dylan Klebold's parents that just kind of left him to it. It was kind of a, a an artistic, um, expressive child, but they, they I don't know. He's obviously. Dylan was living with his parents at the time, whereas James is now, this, uh, this yeah, behaviour yeah, really is really escalated since yeah, moving he, out. He's, he's very far away from his parents. So they're not going to know exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. If anything, they're probably quite like the fact he's a bit more independent now rather than just sleeping in the house day in, day out. He's actually, you know, he, well, he was studying. Um, you know, he was being, they probably thought social. You know, he's getting help for himself. They probably thought he was probably in one of the be better places that he'd been for a long time. So it's very harsh for them to think that you know, they, they, it's their fault. Yeah. So at this point, Holmes is now refusing any kind of uh, uh, medical treatment. Um, he's further isolating himself from friends and family and his uh, kind of homicidal urges are really uh, cranking up. Um, so it's at this point, we're now going to go into the timeline. So between May 22nd and July 2nd of 2012, Holmes legally bought four guns with over 6,000 rounds of ammunition. That is just the fact that you're able to do that excessive he bought a knife gas canisters and an assault vest and spike strips he bought his final gun a smith and western a sport rifle hours after failing the oral exam at his university so spike strips in terms of being able to if a car is chasing you put them out on the road and a car goes oh. over and pop again okay, why does it yeah so it would later go on that that was if if he had to flee the area he wanted the spike strips to pop tires of pursuing officers yeah which is just and this will this will factor into kind of the argument of was he mentally stable was he responsible oh um, it seems very thought out yeah. exactly yeah. so much planning yeah so uh so purchasing and also who just casually sells spike strips are they well, who sells six thousand rounds of ammunition that's the that's the bit it's like who who needs that but i was just thinking spike strips to go back i'm going to fascinate on the spike strips now but unless you're police, police. yeah on June 10th, Holmes submits paperwork to withdraw from the neuroscience program at his university, but does not say why. So obviously his his uh, performance was dropping, uh, academically he was suffering, and he now decides to kind of go ahead with his plan. On June 25th, Holmes applied to join a gun club in Byers, California. Holmes left a rambling voicemail in response to the owner's attempt at contacting him for an induction. The owner asked his staff to get in contact immediately if Holmes ever showed up. He never did. So that in itself shows yeah. they're sensing something's not right here and they're worried about their staff's safety if Holmes, is, if Holmes actually comes to the, the gun club. So they've, yeah. Which is odd, uh, an odd thing to kind of gather just from a, a voicemail, but he has no criminal record, no kind of, he never obviously puts... I guess rambling, just you th if you think he's not, he's, then maybe they could clock that he obviously he's not in a great mental state. Yeah. Um, again, is that, would that be enough for them to perhaps alert authorities? Someone that they assume they'll know has has weapons and isn't in a good place. Maybe that's, you know, obviously in hindsight it's easy for me to say that, but again, possibly a red flag there. Mm -hmm. So on June 29th, Holmes took pictures on his phone of the Aurora Century 16 cinema, including photos of a door latch reportedly showing how it worked. So obviously doing he's doing a kind of recce of the area to kind of plan, plan here and kind of meticulously see see in his mind what he's what he's going to do yeah and if you see photos of it it's a massive cinema complex as part of a shopping mall um or in the uk 
It's like Sydney World, so kind yeah, of, or like a Westfield for the uh, yeah. the UK and Aussie viewers. On July 5th, Holmes also took photos outside the cinema at night, including the floodlights and emergency exits. So yeah, he's he's very much staking out this um, this place and trying to envision how to let his plan unfold. On his Match.com dating profile, Holmes changed the headline to Will You Visit Me in Prison? and featured photos of him with orange hair. This was also on July 5th, a few weeks before his arrest. I don't get what he's going to get out of that. Is he trying to be a bad, bad boy? I don't think he had much time to go on dates after changing it. But um, I think it was just a kind of... Yeah. The thing is, like with Elliot Roger, throughout his stuff, he was, you know, we said before, he was playing the villain. He was very kind of playing up to it. Whereas, you know, Holmes wasn't leaving much there to kind of, I'm a big evil genius or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So it does seem kind of out of character to kind of do a little bit of, you know... <sighs> leaving kind of breadcrumbs like that to kind of link afterwards but um yeah who knows so at 9 p.m on july 7th holmes uses fandango.com to buy tickets to the midnight showing of the dark knight rises at the aurora century 16 cinema and he obtains tickets for screen or theater number nine um holmes apparently chose the century 16 cinema for his attack because he enjoyed movies and that specific cinema had doors that he could lock in order to increase the number of casualties so he's clearly doing his research here, looking at um, looking at exits and entry points. Um, as well as this, uh, he knew it was an area uh, that police response to 911 calls were longer and took more time to, to respond to. He also chose to attack at this particular midnight screening because he thought fewer children would be present. So showing some form of empathy there. Um, Holmes also considered other locations for the mass shooting, such as an airport, but ruled it out because there would be increased security at the these places. Um, he also didn't want his shooting to be confused with an act of terrorism, stating terrorism is not the message. The message is there is no message. Which weirdly is kind of a bit more chilling, isn't it? Because mm. it's just so random. There was, you know, thoughts before he was considered the idea of being a serial killer, but he thought he wouldn't be able, he wouldn't be able to get away with it long enough to kind of get the, the, body, the I hate that phrase, body count yeah. that he was after. Which He's almost applying that kind of scientific mindset as well in that I can get more quicker by doing X but it's, it's kind of like um, Stephen Paddock in terms of the idea of if I'm at top the top floor of a hotel of an area which has got a load of like high buildings if I'm shooting from there they're not going to know where it's from initially there's a festival going on so there's lots of people to shoot yeah. um, it, it's got that kind of the thought process of I'll be able to get away with this for longer if I do it this particular way yeah. so it is, it is very meticulously thought out on July 19th, a few hours before the shooting, Holmes mailed his diary detailing his thoughts and plans in the weeks leading up to the shooting to his psychiatrist's office. The notebook was found after the incident, undelivered in the post room of Anschutz Medical Campus. It contains plans for the attacks, his obsession with killing, and the word why, written over and over again. Prior to the shooting, Holmes called a mental health hotline, reportedly with the hopes that someone would talk him out of his massacre plans. However, hung up after only nine seconds. I didn't really give them a fair chance to talk him out of it. No, I, f I find that bit... It was odd him talking about that in terms of him thinking, yeah, you know, I wanted someone to talk me out of this. Um, we'll get onto it in terms of he did do certain things when he began shooting to kind of step away from what he actually was doing. But yeah, it seemed... Um, I seemed a bit of a, it's kind of like it's like Brevik, Brevik calling the police yeah. from the island. Yeah, and it's not like a, a cry for help in that there's anything tangible going to come out of this call. I mean, he's, it's easy for him to say, oh, I called them in the, oh, oh, in the hope that they could, uh, I mean, it could also be him kind of not taunting them, but I don't know. He's, he's argued whether he was in his right or wrong mindset at yeah. the time. So on July 20th, Holmes can be seen entering the Aurora Century 16 cinema on CCTV footage at approximately midnight, wearing a black skull cap, dark trousers, and a light colored shirt. He also holds the door open for two people behind him. He has technical difficulties retrieving his ticket and scans his phone multiple times. After retrieving his ticket, he hands it to a member of staff and stands in the front of the concession stand for several minutes, then walks towards the screen, not purchasing anything. At approximately 12.20 a.m., Holmes exited the screen, propping open the door with a plastic tablecloth holder. 
and he retrieves three guns and gas canisters from his car, which he had parked near the exit. Witnesses state that he took a phone call before exiting. So this bit here, I think, obviously it was a kind of the opening night of that film. The cinema was absolutely rammed in terms of staff. They weren't able to have the amount of staff they probably usually would have in each cinema room. Um, but I've, ne I've never seen anyone use the exits which are right by the screen because that's the emergency exit so even if you're sitting there and someone's taking a phone call which obviously you expect them to at least leave, leave. the other way so it, it's not again it's just so easy to say with hindsight but that could have I, i'm certainly surprised the door wasn't alarmed as well yeah yeah and he's been obviously wrecky in those particular doors so maybe i don't know yeah he's parked his car there he's got a very clear plan of what he's wanting to wanting to do this is where some of the conspiracies are, are kind of piped in relying on witness testimony they claim that the uh, the attacker was actually in a blue and white plaid shirt and um, that he had a goatee that he was brunette and um, that when this individual was on the phone he was kind of it was as if he was having a conversation in front of everybody giving instructions to someone else that was on the outside of the door. That's what some of the people have alleged uh, the, the conversation was about. So we'll go on to conspiracies more shortly, but this is where kind of some of it gets a bit murky. So at around 12.38 a.m., uh, 18 minutes into the movie starting, Holmes re-enters the screen through the emergency exit, wearing head-to-toe ballistic gear and carrying free guns, setting off several gas canisters. He then opened fired onto the audience using all three guns, killing 12 people, 10 at the scene and two that would later die in hospital, and wounding an additional 70 people. Witnesses report that there was no stopping in the shots that were fired. He never reloaded. Holmes then exited the cinema and shot at people as they attempted to flee. Yeah, so he had a 100 round magazine and uh, he apparently he was just stood there. He didn't move around the cinema shooting at people. He stood in one place just shooting from where he was. He actually hit some people in the, the adjacent uh, theatre as well, through the through the wall. And at first, like, you know, people thought that, like this has happened in a few other cases, people's minds don't go straight to the most dark thing. They think this is maybe just a bit of a, you know, a kind of promo thing for the film, the gas canisters and, you know, Dark Knight Rises. He kind of, he can, he doesn't, it would make sense, yeah, that kind yeah. of thing. It's not too a weird film for that to happen in. So at first I kind of thought, oh, what's, you know, what's going on? And then after hearing, you know, that she's seen the gunfire once the smoke parted, they realised that it was, you know, what actually was, what was going on there. Um, so, you know, people began to run and flee. Um, yeah, there's pictures of the, of the cinema afterwards and you can just see the kind of carnage that happened in, within there. You see CCTV footage of people leaving the other theatres as well and running, the staff hiding behind the counters. Yeah, it, it became, yeah, it, it all happened so quickly. And the thing about the witnesses, like you said, it's it's just, it's, it's obviously the dark cinema, you're watching the film, yeah, yeah. all those things about the colours and things like that, is, it'd be very hard to, to know. And especially you don't, you see someone leaving the cinema you're trying to watch a film so it's kind of like i can understand there being discrepancies there between people because it's you know you aren't paying attention to that guy uh but yeah he was like as you said he was kitted out and in the whole, yeah. whole he was completely like a ballistic outfit like he even he had wore, like bulletproof neck cover yeah him. so he was yeah he was yeah it's it, quite a scene to imagine it's terrifying definitely um so a witness description of the experience um boyfriend and i have evacuated safe and sound the shooting began during a gunfight scene in the movie and at first we thought it was special effects when smoke rose up when shots happened again and people began to run we thought something was up a guy ran in and shouted there was a gunman in the building and the alarms to emergency evacuate started to go off i now know what tear gas feels like i've never had to get down with a police officer screaming at us this is the most fucked up night of my short life that was posted on reddit so just kind of, yeah, you can just kind of imagine those scenes unfolding. It would have been absolutely terrifying. As well as all the, the kind of ballistics gear that he was uh, uh, dressed up in, he also put large headphones on, large Bluetooth headphones on, and started playing techno music at full blast to yeah. kind of disconnect. Exactly, so you can hear the screams, and it's kind of, I guess it's kind of, yeah, not to feel, it makes it feel not real. Yeah. And the thing, his idea of shooting, you know, doing this so late at night, uh, didn't, yeah, there was children there. Yeah, um, yeah. And yeah, his plan there to kind of not harm anyone, any children was didn't didn't go his way. But yeah, the kind of disc it's just so thought out that he he knows oh, he wouldn't be able to do it if he could hear people screaming and everything like that. He wants to make it feel like a game, yeah, um, a first person shooter kind of thing. So he's put on these headphones and just to try and escape. Yeah, and the cinemas as well. They they are hard enough to kind of move around in when it's all lit up because they're quite narrow you know if you're at the back there's literally no you're gonna have to come all the way to the front where the shooter is to get yeah. out 
Um, but that then in pitch black darkness while a, a loud movie is playing, then tear gas is filling the room. You're not going to see anything. Yeah, and like yeah, some people some people uh, adopted the idea of just kind of laying down and kind of you know hiding, and other people decided to make the run for it. Um, again, it's one of those things you never know what you do unless you're in that situation. At 12:39, the first of hundreds of 911 calls were made. Local hospitals were alerted to a potential mass casualty incident. Police are on the scene within minutes of the first 911 calls. Yeah, so we're quite quick to be able to point the finger at the police, but I think it was 90 seconds, uh, and they were there at the scene, which is just like, yeah quick. Yeah, and I think the, the police actually started um, driving casualties themselves to the hospital because the ambulance took a little. The ambulances took a little while to get there. So yeah, an immediate response from uh, from uh, from the police. So just uh, just six minutes later, a man in a gas mask was reported to have been seen near the cinema. The police believe this to be James Holmes. Seven minutes after the first 911 call, Holmes surrenders to police. And at 12.50, police apprehend Holmes without a struggle whilst he was leaning against his car within the parking lot of the cinema. This is where infamously and allegedly Holmes told arresting officers that he was the Joker. Um, so there's kind of conflicting uh, when you play the uh, the police dispatch officer's uh, audio. Some say that he's in the car, he's hunched over the car. One police officer actually thought it was a victim who had been shot in the stomach leaning over the car. Yes, yeah, so um, one, one policeman, um, there's an interview with him, he actually thought, or immediately seeing him, thought he was a, pl was a policeman because he's dressed up yeah. in all the gear. And yeah, he, he immediately thought he was actually another policeman. So again, yeah, imagine then if you're in the cinema, one of the victims, you see someone in that gear coming as well. You're, you're obviously... You, you're not associating that with someone there to to conduct a mass shooting. It's well, even things like tear gas. So why why should that be accessible to a pedestrian, as in just a, someone that isn't within you know the police? It seems very very odd. But yeah, so yeah, and, and him saying the Joker wasn't it Bane in Dark Knight Rises? So he looks he he's got the gas mask on, so he looks like Bane. But I mean, like in, the Joker dies in the film before. Yeah, his Batman logic maybe not quite a point, but he um. Yeah, he's dressed as Bane. He's got kind of Batman. He's not dressed as Bane. Well, he's got the. He's got a gas mask on. He's got a gas mask on like Bane. He's dressed head to toe in black riot gear, kind of similar to Batman. And then he's claiming to be the Joker. So, Batman all over the place, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Um, during his arrest, Holmes was reported to be calm and detached, showing interest in watching the aftermath, of, which is disturbing as hell, mm. showing great interest in watching the aftermath of the shooting from the back of the police car. Which kind of reminds me of that scene in the Joker at the end when he's like the streets are going crazy. Police retrieved several guns from both the cinema and Holmes's car. Yeah, because I mean he did, as you know, he uh, did obtain uh, six thousand rounds, um, and he only shot, I think, seventy-six times from that. Obviously, you know, there's seventy injuries there, uh, which is you know, but it's luckily he wasn't able to use. You know the full extent of his, his weaponry. Yeah, I think he started with the shotgun and then used all, got through all the ammunition there. Then he moved on to the rifle, which he'd fired so many times that it then overheated and jammed. And then he moved on to handguns. So he's used gone through all of his, all of his arsenal there, which is just yeah to start on a shotgun into a crowd like that as well. Any of them? Well, yeah. At 5.20 a.m., President Obama issued the following statement. Michelle and I are shocked and saddened by the horrific and tragic shooting in Colorado. Federal and local law enforcement are still responding, and my administration will do everything that we can to support the people of Aurora in this extraordinarily difficult time. We are committed to bring whoever was responsible to the justice, ensuring the safety of our people, and caring for those who have been wounded. As we do when confronted by moments of darkness and challenge, we must now come together as one American family. All of us must have the people of Aurora in our thoughts and prayers as they confront the loss of family, friends and neighbours, and we must stand together with them in the challenging hours and days to come. This is the part that really confuses me, and this is where some of the conspiracies also then um, shed a, a, a fair amount of weight, is that after his arrest, Holmes told the police that he had placed several explosive devices and tripwires within his apartment before coming to the theatre. He said that there was three initiating devices, one of which was a remote control that he had put next to a remote control car on top of a boombox in a trash bag, uh, so quite complex, um, which he set to play 40 minutes of silence and then loud music aiming to attract someone to play with the toy car and unknowingly set off the explosives in Holmes' department. 
So what I don't get there is if he's gone through all this elaborate planning and putting it together, this is where kind of the, the mindset of Holmes comes into question because did he want that bomb to go off and cause uh, mass uh, mass injuries or mass, uh, m- mass casualties? Um, was there a bomb in the first place or was this not, you know, was this all a hoax? And then secondly, if you have gone through all that effort, why tell them about it? Maybe it's kind of like, in the scene, obviously it's come clear he, he's maybe achieved what he wanted to achieve. I think perhaps he, he as well thought that he would have been shot down and you know he wouldn't have to live with the guilt of that happening as well. Uh, maybe it all kind of was becoming all too clear. There was that moment of, of doubt when he wanted to be talked down and maybe after talking to police and seeing the devastation he caused, like we said before, growing up and everything like that, he, he, he wasn't malicious, he wasn't, maybe it was just a case of, and he has to have these manic stages where he goes to be really quiet and kind of kind of deep in thought to being very out there so perhaps it was just a case of you know he fluctuated his fluctuating kind of emotion there and he, he mm. thought that was the right thing to do perhaps he was thinking if i if i let them to this now that might give me a lesser uh, sentencing yeah which uh, you know obviously after that you're not gonna get any time off but Maybe yeah thinking of his neighbors or something yeah in the same building yeah Five buildings, including Holmes' apartment building on Paris Street, were evacuated. On July 21st, investigators confirmed they had disarmed all makeshift bombs, which included 30 homemade grenades and 10 gallons of gasoline. It's just all so premeditated and mm-hmm. all so thought out. And like that, you know, obviously within the trial, you can't say it was just a spur of the moment mm-hmm. decision. Yeah, yeah, is, yeah. yeah. And then we'll go on to motive and the aftermath. But what's really interesting as well is he'd clearly brought those uh, spike strips. He didn't commit suicide. He didn't decide to kind of, uh, I don't know, blow himself up and ca- cause even more. Yeah, uh, or, or suicide there. by cop, which I think is probably what he was thinking might happen. Uh, yeah. yeah. Instead of kind of running towards them or anything, he's just hunched over a car and calmly uh, detained. Is he planning on surviving this? Because everything points points to him wanting to survive, and not take his own life with well, him. Well, that's what I think you said. He 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 hadn't actually he planned everything out so thoroughly. He didn't actually have a plan for afterwards. Afterwards, he basically said he was going to see what he how he kind felt. of wing it afterwards. Yeah. So he's I guess yeah he could either drive off he could have easily easily driven off with all the chaos going on and then kind of been on the run or in that way you're probably more likely to be killed. Yeah. Or if he stood there and kind of surrendered to the policeman, uh, which he did, um, then he's more likely to survive it. Um, and maybe he is, maybe he immediately was starting to regret things because, as you said, he kind of gave them the details to disarm those things, not cause further yeah. casualties. There was also kind of, it's alleged that the whole motive behind this, and we'll go through a few of them, was that he wanted, he did it for the fame and that he wanted to, to make a name for himself because he felt that in, in science and in his career, which kind of lines up with his academic performance dipping slightly, yeah. he felt he wasn't going to make it in the science industry and wasn't going to make a name for himself there. So he, he decided to do this, which is kind of a... But then he's always, the thing is, he's always had the hunger from, from a young childhood of wanting, like he's had this need or want or fantasy, sorry, to perform an act like this. So I kind of feel like, it's easier and probably nicer for us to assume those kind of things and think there must be a, re- a real reason why he's done this. But it's a lot scarier just to think, it's like the paddock thing, it's a lot scarier to think someone would just do this because they can rather than something prompted them to do it. Because it, do- it doesn't seem like there's a, there's a trigger. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. Obviously, he dropped out of class and all that stuff with, with that one exam, but they weren't going to expel him, they were going to keep him on. Um, so yeah, it, it seems you want to rationalize it and think why, but it doesn't really appear to be a clear one. Yeah. So with the aftermath, um, Warner Brothers cancelled the Paris premiere and the, and the remaining press opportunities for The Dark Knight Rises because you know they're worried about copycats. Um, Warner Brothers issued a statement saying Warner Brothers is deeply saddened to learn about this shocking incident. We extend our sincere sympathies to the families and loved ones of the victims at this tragic time. And Christopher Nolan, the director of The Dark Knight Rises, said, The movie theatre is my home, and the idea that someone would violate that innocent and hopeful place in such an unbearably savage way is devastating to me. Nothing any of us can say could ever adequately express our feelings for the innocent victims of this appalling crime, but our thoughts are with them and their families. Yeah, it's a tough one because obviously one of the one of the earlier movies that's when uh, Heath Ledger sadly passed away. So there was kind of a, a dark shadow over the, the franchise from that moment onwards. And then 
um, so there was there were also calls in the first place for Todd Phillips' uh, movie Joker not to come out to have additional security presence um, through fears of in- triggering or inspiring copycats or incels anything like that. So yeah, it's uh, and I know that's not part of the same franchise. So sorry, Batman fans, but uh, it's, it's the same um, comic book universe. And the fact that if he, if he did refer to himself as you know the Joker, it, it, it all links up. The studio also cancelled other premieres in Mexico and Japan, and they scaled down the marketing campaign in Finland, and decided not to report box office figures for the movie until July 23rd. So a little more on the conspiracy side of things here, then obviously Holmes has been convicted, but there are still people that, that kind of believe that there were more than one uh, individuals responsible for this particular act. And you can kind of understand people having different opinions. There's very much uh, a lot of similarities to the Las Vegas shooting, the Stephen Paddock one. Hey, go on. I'm going to uh, disagree yeah. with this. Go on. Disagree with all of them. It's fine. Um, so first of all, there's a whole documentary that's been the only thing, in fact, like kind of documentary or feature length that we could find on the case by Mark Howitt, who just heavily points out all the kind of flaws in it being a one person or a, a, a false flag. Um, so first of all, multiple victims coming forward to say multiple shooters were present, saying they instead of he. Yeah, that's, not, that's when the police... Um on the police uh, radio, you can hear them refer to it as that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's there was another kind of bag discovered near the cinema, yeah. which had another gas mask in, hundreds of feet away from the theatre. But no, in homes, that was probably a reserve. Well, it's like no, in homes. Not that I. <laughs> the thing for me is, people inside the cinema have said that they saw one person shooting. Yes, people inside the cinema have also said that there were multiple shooters. It's the same as Vegas because there was a lot of... Well, Vegas, you can understand because Vegas is going through a hotel window like many floors up. Surely CCTV within the cinema could see. Well, that was it. But then there was a lot of conspiracy theories kind of further prompted by the fact they didn't release the CCTV, but they wouldn't release anything like that for yeah, fear well, yeah, of copycats. But you wouldn't release it anyway because you're, people are getting killed. Well, yeah. But in terms of him entering and exiting, I guess, the, the emergency exits, they've not released that. They found two gas masks, as you said. Um, uh, individual... Uh, um, uh, uh, impact witness stating that the shooter was in a blue and white plaid shirt um, whereas Holmes was actually in all black riot gear um, a guy that left the emergency exit um, and came back in via the shooter's entrance had a goatee um, Selena Jordan who was an eyewitness claimed that an alarm was going off inside the theatre that said murder in the theatre murder in the theatre however she was kind of shocked to learn uh, that it was actually saying emergency in theatre, emergency in theatre. She said, it's crazy that they got an alarm saying that there's a murder in the theatre, you know. Um, as soon as Holmes uh, uh, is arrested, although you you offered a pretty good opinion to this one, he tells police immediately about the elaborate maze of booby traps and bombs in his house. Um, why would you want to warn police of this if you intended for them to work? But I think, I think you're just... But then, but, then, but then why... Yeah. These are this guy's conspiracies, not mine. I don't, I don't buy into it either. There were also no signs of any of the witnesses being impacted at all by tear gas. So there was no one with kind of red eyes or mucusy nose, mouth. Uh, nobody struggling to breathe or speak or coughing while giving all of the interviews. So what's the, what's the thought there? So the, the thought is that there was no tear gas. Okay, but so that means what they... <laughs> what, what, so I, I don't you... know what that <laughs> adds to his argument. Okay, so maybe through some uh, smoke canisters rather than tear gas. Yeah. So if you want to watch it, it's called The James Holmes Conspiracy by Mark Howitt. It sounds full of... <laughs> but if you want to watch it, enjoy it. Um, so anyway, afterwards, um, soon afterwards, on, on release of the suspect's names, ABC reported that they'd spoken with the alleged gunman, James Holmes' mother. They were back in San Diego, and she reportedly told ABC News, you have the right person, I need to call the police, I need to fly out to Colorado. Again, like... Well, as we said, there's lots of, t- lots of times throughout this kind of case and throughout uh, Holmes's adolescence and childhood where he does things and acts in ways which you don't really associate with, like the, like the um, will you visit me in prison. Yeah. Uh, when he was post-arrest interview with the police, um, the BBC described him as cockily responding to the question how to spell his name. He said, like Sherlock. <laughs> which, um, snidey. We'll go, we'll go into, obviously, he was on medication as well which you know can drastically affect your behavior and, and, and the way you act and kind of disassociating yourself with certain things. 
but also in an interview when he was left alone with paper bags in his hands yeah, I saw this. to secure forensic evidence it's caught he's caught on camera using them to talk to one another like sock puppets it's really weird so i hadn't seen the i've seen a lot of inve a lot of interviews with him from after his arrest but i hadn't this was like hours after the shooting and they basically place each hand into what looks like mcdonald's bags just brown paper bags just yeah. brown paper bags yeah you and me? he's yeah <laughs> And he's, um, yeah, he is literally, it's looked like he's either getting ready for a boxing match or he's, it's bizarre. I've never seen paper bags. I don't know, just, just cuff him. Yeah, but it's, as I said, it's Preserve to, secu fingerprints. to secure forensic evidence. Yeah. His fingerprints wouldn't have, wouldn't have fallen off without the bags on, but um, it's just secured the forensic Fuck evidence. Off. <laughs> Perfect. So um, obviously we're going to go to uh, now when Holmes appears in court. And this is where really where they're going to put Holmes under the hammer. Nothing. So Holmes' book and photo was released and he first appeared in court on July 23rd, 2012. So according to other reports, he was he seemed very dazed and largely unaware of his surroundings. As we said, he was very kind of heavily medicated at this time. So like kind of surround the kind of erratic behavior. And, you know, he's even appeared to be nodding off during the court case. You know, obviously, uh, yeah, I, if you were there and it's you, essentially your life is on the line, you can imagine that's going to be the most terrifying thing that fill you with like, adrenaline and dread. It's but he's, but he's able to just to kind of just nod off as he's hearing all these things happening. So, yeah, I think he's very heavily medicated at this point. Yeah, and I mean, when you first, because they were, they, all of this became public record almost immediately, didn't it? So as soon as you start seeing the footage of him, he's got his dyed hair, he's in the orange jumpsuit. He just looks as if one second he's unaware of, of the, the his, completely unaware of his surroundings, but then the next second just completely disinterested in them as well. Yeah. It's a really, really bizarre footage. So obviously with uh, with this taking place in, in Colorado, um, the jury, uh, the kind of the process of assembling the jury um, became uh, widely kind of scrutinized due to the fact that there were, uh, there were concerns about the selection of jurors since at least two from the initial pool of 12 jurors had ties to uh, victims that, oh. of the Columbine shooting. Yeah. Um, so that, that selection process um, went on a, 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 for a period of time because one of them was the aunt of a Columbine su survivor and one of them was actually a student at Columbine at the time um, and was also a former friend of, of Eric and Dylan. That notebook that he sent to his um, psychiatrist, which, which you know, it wasn't obtained before the, before the, um, the attack happened, um, he actually, the notebook was actually dedicated to, um, he had written Gooba, Chrissy and Bobo, which were all pet names for his, his mother, sister and father. And it included messages saying "love yous," spelled "love y u h s," which <clears throat> it can't. To me, it kind of feels like it's just a dedication of what he's done is to them, which is a very horrible thought. Um, but the notebook included many signs of loose lucidity as well. Um, you know, explaining why why he wanted to come out of the plan and what, how he's going to do it. But the, apparently, his thoughts seemed very scattered and disorganized. Like we said, he, you know, with his mental state, it, it was kind of mm. very erratic. Like that kind of that gun club said. From his defense's perspective as well, if they've just got to him, um, you know, because initially he could have got the death penalty, and I think it would have been one of the clear early options was them to play for that kind of. Uh, uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. Yeah. So that he claimed to have amnesia and not remember any of it, but then a few weeks later would completely backtrack on that. So it's, yeah. I think, yeah, the level of planning throughout all of this, it, it, his, because his mental health was very much questioned, um, well, it was put as a kind of factor of all this. And I, th I think you can safely say, yeah, um, he suffered from a lot of mental health issues, which um, kind of spiraled out of control. He didn't uh, follow treatment plans and things that were given to him. Um, and people didn't step into places when probably, you know, could have helped prevent these things. It just this kind of demonstrates a lot of it. His, psycho, his psychosis at this time, he looked at it as each life he took was worth a point, which added yeah. value to his own life because he needed to, because he, he felt like he needed to add value to himself. Um, so he, he, he reasoned in his head that he, if he, uh, if he got added more value to his life, he wouldn't have to kill himself. But he said that he never wanted to build life points by taking the lives of children, as we mentioned earlier. But Holmes believed that he had raised his life capital, is what he says, to 13, when an ordinary person's would simply be worth a single point. So he kind of feels like he's transcended now into this kind of higher tier of of human, which that really kind of underlines his, you know, where his head was at the time. Absolutely. So the, the trial is ongoing. Um, there's lots of... Um 
it took a, a long time for them to kind of fine tune the the jury side of things. Uh, some jurors were also dismissed after judges uncovered that they were personal friends of some of the victims. So that that selection process went on longer than usual. So also the judge Sylvester um, had to delay the actual um, the court proceedings uh, because of suicide attempts by Holmes, and they delayed it until December 2012. One of his suicide attempts was just him ramming his head into the prison wall um, but the prison officers described his attempts as very kind of half-hearted and just kind of acting out rather than an actual serious attempt so Holmes actually was interviewed uh, by a court psychiatrist and there's there's, there's over 22 hours of this mm -hmm. and doing this research there's actually yeah, they're, they're all available like five to six hour videos online on YouTube of this um, he states he doesn't remember gun hearing gunshots or panic screams because of his techno music is playing he didn't view his targets as people he said that they're just amorphous numbers, sacrifices to his own peculiar point system. Yeah, it, the, in terms of a motive from his side, like, like Tom said, there's ton, all, all the footage is available online. Um, there's a particular five and a half hour uh, video um, of one of his uh, kind of post conviction interviews, which gives a little bit of light onto a motive. So basically, he said uh, he was feeling very depressed and struggled to see any meaning to his or any other human being's existence. He said that instead of turning depression into self harm, he decided to turn it into a desire to harm others. Um, and a desire that he would late, later uh, carry out with this shooting. As Tom said, he had a value system wherein um, any person that he killed would be an extra point to his, his, his life value. He became obsessed with the idea of accumulating other humans' values rather than his own. Uh, Holmes described his horrific acts as being on a mission with a successful outcome, which is just... Disgusting. So yeah, he, he faced originally 142 counts, um, 24 counts of first degree murder, 116 counts of attempt to commit first degree murder, uh, one count of possession of explosives devices and one sentence enhancer for a crime of violence. But the prosecutors would then go on to add 24 more attempted murder charges four months later related to 12 more victims, bringing the total number of counts against him to 166. So his lawyers went for the um, mentally ill uh, defence. Um, and one schizophrenia expert testified he was psychotic and legally insane, but two state-appointed doctors found otherwise. He went on to be diagnosed with having schizotypal personality disorder. In one of the words of the experts there, she said Holmes was indeed sick and antisocial, but he was rational, which I think the way he behaved and planned all this thing, you can, you can, kind, of, you can kind of see that. So the, the, the trial went on for 11 weeks, and over 12 hours of deliberation, a jury found Holmes guilty of 24 counts of first-degree murder, two counts of, for each of the 12 victims. He was also found guilty of 140 counts of attempted murder for the 70 people wounded and guilty of the, of the one count of possession or control of an explosive device. And on June 4th, 2013, the presiding judge accepted his plea of insanity defence. On August 5th, 2013, Holmes was transferred to the Colorado Mental Health Institute and it is not known how long he will remain there. Yeah, so basically they ended up kind of doubling um, the those uh, the life sentences for those victims and uh, injured. So it was, yeah, 140 from the 70 he'd injured and then 24. So for every victim he claimed, they gave him two life sentences and for every person he injured, they doubled that. So they wanted to make a point here, um, for, you know, to w warn off, essentially warn off any kind of copycat um, killers. So as we mentioned, he, you know, he 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 basically he was very explicit. The reason why he was using uh, this time was obviously to have you know police reacting, uh, taking longer to react, even though they didn't. They were very quick to react, but also to avoid any fatalities involving children. But the youngest fatality was actually six years old, Veronica Moses Sullivan, who died from bullet injuries. Um, her mother as well was critically injured in the shooting and suffered a miscarriage a week after the attack. The, the youngest person injured in the shooting was actually three months old. Three of the five hospitals treating the victims actually announced that they would limit medical bills or forgive them entirely, which, you know, is very admirable of them. Um, the Community First Foundation collected more than $5 million for a fund for the victims and for the families. It's a very, very dark case, and it seems like with a lot of our cases that we cover, um, there were things that happened along the way which you feel should have sparked a bit more action and prevention. 
that seem to have gone un- unnoticed and uh, under the radar a little bit. As uh, as this uh, as this particular case uh, made global news and 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 kind of major headlines across the world, um, Holmes has acquired uh, a large female following, a uh, large uh, fan base as well. So he receives regular love letters. He ha- there was one particular picture I saw of his one of his earlier cells where he had literally got a, a kind of like a, a cork board of just like dozens of different girls uh, photos on them and letters all hung up and it, it was also alleged that he had his own mug shot printed off and, and stuck on one of his walls yeah there, there is, is, is there's lots and lots of um, letters sending online him. of people sending him letters sending him money, money to buy yeah. things you know kind of wishing him well supporting him I mean it's such a weird phenomenon phenom- such a weird phenomenon ah Phenomenon. Mm. <laughs> phenomenon. Phenomenon. Yeah, it's such a weird phenomenon. <laughs> it's such a weird phenomenon that that this happens when people do such horrible things that it seems to attract a lot of people. Um, but yeah, there's lots and lots of letters and like, f- I guess you could say kind of fan mail and people sending pictures of themselves yeah. to him, um, which is very unsettling and unnerving. Absolutely. Obviously, the the initial. Um, I mean. With James Holmes, he kind of his trial. There's lots of different. Uh, we'll go on to lookalikes shortly, but the, every photo of him in court, uh, he has a different kind of appearance. Yeah, I think it obviously spanned quite. A lot, uh, I mean, him his appearances in court over the time has, has spanned quite a long time, and he, his change, and as well, I think the meds he must have been on. Yeah, you see, kind of there's the footage of him as a younger guy, kind of talking to a, a classroom of people, and then you see him in talking to a psychiatrist. He seems just, very kind of like monotone and. Um, lack of effect yeah yeah absolutely uh there was also a very very eerie photo of him uh shortly before the attacks where wherein he wore pupil dilating contact lenses and he was holding one of his homemade constructed bombs which yeah. looked like the bombs out of um like a video game it looked a very cartoon looking kind of coconut shell kind of a bit like worms yes a cluster bomb from worms it looks yeah. a bit like but yeah we're going to a little bit of trivia about this um one of them mentioned about possible motivations behind it. Um, so people started formulating their own theories hours after the event. Um, one of the most prominent unfounded rumors was that Holmes took part in Occupy San Diego and that the entire shooting was staged by the FBI. Conspiracy theories. There was, it draws a lot of similarities from this and the Sandy Hook school shooting because straight away there was misinformation reported, journalists getting it wrong, police getting it wrong, and there was so little known about um, that particular perpetrator. That but as well, that it's always a lot of things n- nowadays can just be put out online, and exactly. just that spreads, and people think that's the the gospel, which is like that's how things are facing spread. But yeah, you're completely right. There is a lot of they've seen the Sandy Hook and kind of the reporting of it and the theories behind it. It seems to be every mass shooting, there seems to be the government are behind it. Yeah, yeah. Well, people use them for a different platform. They use these events as platforms to further their political yeah, agendas or yeah. whatever. This is an also quite an interesting uh, point. At the time of his arrest, Holmes gave his... So he's making this smarky, snarky, smarky comment about... Snarky. Sh- snarky comment about Sherlock Holmes. At the time of his arrest, he gave his occupation as labourer. So he's kind of dropped that whole scientific background and uh, student background and claimed to have been a labourer at the time. Bizarre. Not for all labourers there, but... Not at all, not at all. Just interesting for Holmes. There's also a reconstruction um, of the shooting, like a digital reconstruction, which is hideous to watch but it's been made up basically on forensic ballistics uh reconstructing bullet entries and victim statements and where they found the bullets and that shows you then the pure scope of what happened like the size of the theater yeah the, the crime scene photos and with all the kind of ballistic lines where the bullets went it looks like a kid's drawn over a photo yeah there's so many yeah, colored yeah. lines just all over the place it shows the sheer amount of bullets that are fired within that room and as we said it, it went through the wall and actually hit people in the adjoining theater next door which yeah there was also then obviously the the links to Batman and that that particular franchise and that he was the Joker and all this stuff. But um, in one of the investigations, it was revealed that Holmes had no ties whatsoever to Batman and that he picked that particular movie and that particular time because he that was when he knew it would be full. Yeah, and could claim the most victims, which again is just that, that kind of predetermined planning aspect. Definitely, yeah. So today he's still in a secure unit and on October 8th of 2015, Holmes was assaulted by another inmate identified as Mark Daniels who uh, had been convicted of auto theft. 
Uh, Daniels attacked Holmes after a prison guard inadvertently opened a gate separating the two of them. Um, he struck Holmes twice before being subdued by prison staff. At that time, Holmes was not allowed interaction with other inmates, um, and as a result of that particular attack, he was secretly transferred to an undisclosed location out of state. Yeah, I think with that, obviously, with a high-profile prisoner, it's a way for other prisoners to make a name for themselves or to seek revenge on that person. Uh, so, you know, they usually get put and seg away from from other people. So the fact that he'd obviously killed so many people, but so many females and, and children as well, the youngest victim being six. All the inmates were talking about killing him from day one. Everyone was looking for an opportunity. Um, another inmate described Holmes as spitting at the door and spitting at the guards in an, in an attempt to look crazy. On his first night in jail, the other inmates reportedly chanted Kid Killer all the way through the night in reference to the fact that he had killed a six-year-old audience member. An employee at the prison claims Holmes still thinks he's acting in a movie and has adopted the Joker persona. In all the interviews after that, all things, it doesn't seem like he's... Maybe he does, maybe he, he does act up and, like you said before, he kind of goes in like manic episodes where he is really introverted or extroverted so yeah yeah it's a, it's, it's a very sad case it's a very kind of as i said before it seems like a case that could possibly you know been avoided but last like, a lot of those cases are so easy to say with hindsight involved mm. um but yeah a little bit of like relief which we like to do at the end which kind of we say a lookalike and lookalike is for home as he does look in a very short space of time he looks like five different people anyway um i struggle with this uh, i only got one um but Holmes when he's kind of at school I think he looks like a grown-up version of Alfalfa from Little Rascals. That's very good. Yeah. Um, but Ben, I'm sure you've got... Yeah, well, it's been we've been out of action for a while, so I've got quite a few. And for those listening via audio, thank you so much for listening, first of all. But we also are a YouTube platform, so every episode uh, has a, a visual version of it. We throw our lookalike he's up now. So uh, first of all, we're going to rule out the Joker lookalike because he doesn't look like any of the Jokers I've ever seen. No. Um, it has been a while, so I've had time to get a few. The first one is that um, bearded courtroom Holmes, who literally looks different in every single photo we've seen, uh, bearded brunette courtroom Holmes looks a little bit like internet hacker Weave. It's not. It's such a niche shout, but also okay. not very good. Not very good. <laughs> okay. Um, I've seen a lot of other uh, comparisons online for Mark Zuckerberg, but or Zuckerberg um, didn't really get that. I can kind of see it. Not the kind of laminated faced Mark Zuckerberg there is now, mm. but maybe in an earlier stage of Zuckerberg. Okay. Uh, he looks like a YouTuber I used to watch back in the day, Tabuscus, uh, Toby Turner. A little bit. He's very niche with these ones. Okay, okay, I've got better ones. Um, Do them now. Oh, that's oh, a terrible one. Yeah. <laughs> fucking hell. An easy... <laughs> I've put an easy one here. He just, looks like the son of Carrot Top. Just because he's got Dido on show. Um, you could say the son of Dee Dee from... You like this one? I don't, I, don't, I don't like it. I could say it straight away. I could see it. Yeah. It doesn't look like Beaker. The Muppet Beaker. It doesn't look like him. Dan likes it. What do you mean he looked like? His orange hair. And finally, probably my strongest one. What well, you said they were going to be there. No, this is my. I've written this down. Baseball player Hunter Pence. Big fan of him, are you? Big fan of baseball. <laughs> so, did you Google what he looks like? No. So, how do you know who Hunter Pence is? Barstool Sports. Again, I don't think that. I just had this ready for months. Did you? Sorry about that. I said it's light relief. Uh, it's just angered me. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> um, Thank you so much for listening or watching to today's case. Uh, we're very happy to be back. As we said, it's going to be a 12-part series. Lots of big cases uh, to show you this series. And um, if you enjoyed it, why not give us a like, subscribe, because as we said, we're going to be back every Monday. And uh, if you want extra content, why not pop over to Patreon? Definitely. And thank you so much to all the new people. I know we've been away for a few weeks, but all the new people that have been subscribing, that have been binging, um, all the lovely feedback has been amazing. Um, remember to hit us up on all the socials, which is at Could Murder a Pod. But and as well, please let us know look alike as you think, because <laughs> just let us know and, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be intrigued to, to hear from you. But anyway, guys, good to be back. Yeah. Lots, to, lots of more cases to come. All right, guys, like we always say, we say this all the time. Keep doing what you do. Unless, um... <laughs> Go on. Beaker from the Muppets. Mm, terrible, terrible. Unless it's, called, unless it's saying terrible lookalike, which well, you spent months apparently doing. Anyway, guys, thank you so much, and we'll see you again next time. See you next week.
Goodbye. <laughs> Love it. Awesome. Love it. Another huge thanks to this episode sponsor, Pouch. And don't forget when downloading Pouch to use our link. It really helps support the podcast. That link again is joinpouch.com forward slash I forward slash I could murder a podcast. Ha, 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 ha.